I'd like to introduce you to Chloe Chow. So welcome, Chloe, and thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that nice introduction. Wow. All right, if everyone can just bear with me for one moment, I am going to share my screen. I'm going to stop sharing and that might help you share. Did that help? Okay, good. I think so. One moment. I'm just going to put it into present mode. Uh, 2020. <laughs> <laughs> it's like one big personality test, don't you think? Sure. I'm, waiting, I'm waiting for somebody to jump out and say, you know, you're on whatever camera <laughs> or, or what was it, Ashton Kutcher, the, you know, being punked or whatever you feel a lot these days, like we're being definitely poked by the universe. All right. Yeah, and I do agree with that. All right, let me know if this looks good, if it's full screen. It is full screen. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yes, thanks so much for the introduction and thanks so much for joining everybody. I'm really excited to, to have this discussion. I think this year has been a roller coaster for many of us. And I am going to share a little bit of my own personal journey with both mental health, mental wellness, um, including mental illness. And I'm gonna share a little bit about how that experience has, has taught me the, the value of authentic human connections and the projects that I've been so lucky to have worked with. And then we will do a little bit of discussion. Um, there, I will ask a couple of questions. Some of them are polls, some of them um, are just reflective questions. Um, don't worry, I will, I will guide everyone through this process. But just before we start, um, I would love if we could just all kind of ground and take a few breaths to just really come into this moment because I know I had a bit of a crazy day and I think this is just kind of a nice way to kind of let go of whatever happened on this Tuesday. I'm in, in Montreal today, it was super cloudy and fuzzy and damp. So um, if you can, if you feel safe, you can close your eyes, but no need at all. Um, we're just gonna do a few breaths. So on the count of four, we're gonna take an inhale. So one, two, three, four, and then we're just gonna hold two, three, Four, and now exhale, two, three, four, and hold, two, three, four, and inhale, two, three, four, and hold, two, three, four, and exhale, two, three, four, and hold, two, three, four. So thank you. I like to do this at the start of any kind of activity that I really participate in in a group setting. I just find it helps kind of ground and I don't know, brings us into the present moment. So without further ado, let's see, how am I gonna, there we go. So I really, really love this quote by Ralph Nichols. So the most Basic of all human needs is the need to understand and be understood. The best way to understand people is to listen to them. So I think you'll notice as I go through this presentation and this talk that um, listening and human connection are two very central themes. So I'm gonna kind of take everybody back just on a little personal journey of mental health. And my, my journey with mental illness really starts at uh, the age of 16. So this photo that you see here, I was 17. This was when I graduated high school and I'm not sure why I chose a, what looks like a wedding gown for my prom dress, but I did. Um, so this, I, I chose this photo because I, when I was in high school in my last two years, I was in somewhat of an emotionally abusive relationship and had a lot of doubts about what I was going to be doing, quote unquote, with the rest of my life. Um, I think this is not very uncommon. I think a lot of people, as they're transitioning through whatever it is, from high school to, in Quebec, we have CJEP. I know in Ontario, you just go right into university. Um, 
but any big kind of major transitions, it's, it's a really difficult time. I think we as humans have a really hard time with change. And this period in particular was the first time in my life that I experienced a major depressive episode. So not able to get out of bed for a few days, um, feeling anhedonia. So the lack of being able to feel any kind of joy. And at the time, I did not feel super comfortable with myself. I did not have kind of what I call the toolbox to cope with hardship. And I also felt a lot of shame about what I was going through. Um, one thing I've, I've learned about depression is that, you know, depression will bring you down, but shame will keep you silent. And I think that there is a lot of shame around not just depression, but any other kinds of mental illness and also just any kinds of hardships in life. I think probably everyone can relate to the fact that we love to share a really polished version of ourselves to the world. Um, and this picture for me really embodies that. Um, so these are three of my closest friends at the time, um, still close with them, but they didn't really have any idea what was going on kind of internally. Um, cause I wasn't ready to share that. It felt scary. It, I, it was embarrassing. I didn't really know how to navigate that. Um, and at this time I actually did not reach out for any kind of help. Um, I moved on to what we have in in Quebec, CJEP. So this was kind of two years in between high school and university. Very strange system in Quebec, honestly. But um, this kind of marked a, a period of my life that I don't necessarily feel proud of. I was drinking a lot as like a young adult, you know, just in Quebec, the drinking age is 18. So it was, it was a lot of avoidance, um, avoidance with kind of um, indulgent social situations, avoidance with alcohol use, avoidance with kind of throwing myself into a career path that I would later choose to uh, pivot away from. Um, so hold on one moment, I'm still having a hard time switching, I think, here we go. So um, when I started university, so this was actually three years after I left high school because you do that two years of CJA, I thought that I wanted to become a doctor. I had always, or not always, but in my kind of later high school years, I thought, you know, I would love to help people. I think I want to become a physician. So I tried really hard to get into pre-med. I got rejected. Um, then I thought I was doing kind of the next best thing, which in my mind was physiology at uh, McGill. I did one semester of that, uh, failed one, failed two courses, dropped out of one course, passed two other courses, um, and then had a bit of a breakdown. And that's when I really reached out. It was actually to my mother to say, okay, I think I actually do need some help. And that was really quite scary. Um, I'm not sure how many people here have sought professional support. I think at the time, it felt, and I don't know if this is because I was a lot younger, but it felt like a very taboo thing. It wasn't something I would necessarily joke about with friends the way that I, I do now. But at the time, it was a very, very intimidating thing. But therapy was what I feel like I can say now, uh, truly a lifesaver. Um, having someone to provide therapeutic techniques and really validate everything that I was going through was invaluable. And I saw a therapist for, for quite a long time, uh, several months. And my relationship with therapy since then has been very intermittent. I'll go when I feel like I need some additional support and then when I'm feeling good, I'll stop uh, my visits. So what I noticed after going to therapy for a few months, once I was kind of in a better emotional, psychological, physical state, I noticed that I still really enjoyed going to therapy, but that I didn't truly need it anymore. And it, it became very apparent that, you know, I, I had actually um, put into practice all the techniques 
and the exercises that I'd worked on with my therapist, but it still really felt like I enjoyed going to have someone who had no stake in my life, who was just the third party support system who could be there to listen to me and to be present with me and to validate the feelings that I was going through. So moving forward, I very serendipitously met this wonderful woman named Sarah Fennessy. So she was another, so I'm, just to caveat this, I switched from physiology to psychology, which I think was probably what I had wanted to do all along, but felt afraid to, to pivot. Um, and then in psychology at McGill, I happened to meet this woman named Sarah, and you can see her in the photo on the right-hand side. And she had a very similar experience with therapy to myself. Um, she had a very traumatic experience on a ship that sank and she had PTSD for, for several years and she had gone to therapy, but experience like I had this kind of holding on to, to having someone in your life as a third party support, even though the, the reasons that we had gone to find that support in the first place were no longer there. So she actually had this idea to offer something in between professional support and something above just a friend or a family member. So someone who will listen to you, validate your feelings, but they're not there to provide therapeutic intervention. They're not there to assess you. They're really just there to be present with you in the moment and listen to you, help guide the conversation, ask questions that help you see your situation in a different way. So we put up a very, very ugly and basic landing page. Um, this was just kind of a side project. We were in our last year and we just thought, why not? Why don't we find a group of people who are interested in volunteering. Um, we met with a psychologist who I ended up interning with and he helped us develop you know, a very basic training program, uh, just how to actively listen. So how to really intentionally listen to someone else, not listening to hear, but really listening to understand. And after we'd done this for about a year, we entered into McGill's startup competition and we ended up winning first place, which really surprised us because we didn't think that we didn't think that this was, you know, something that could actually turn into something um, long lasting, something that would, would kind of stick around and people would actually use. But that competition really gave us a lot of exposure. We got a little bit of money. Um, and from then we made some connections with web developers. We got a real website set up and we redefined our, our training program. So Basically, Vent Over Tea as it stands today has evolved quite a bit. So this was six years ago when Sarah and I first met and five years ago since we officially incorporate, incorporated as a nonprofit organization. Um, but we now offer, in, in normal times, we offer a free in-person listening service and the meetings usually take place in cafes around Montreal. Obviously with coronavirus that has changed um, we moved all, all our sessions online, so it's either on the phone or we do, you know, Zoom or Google Hangout, whatever people are comfortable with. And we have an amazing group of volunteer listeners who go through now a quite regimented program of how to listen, ask questions that keep the conversation going, how to know when something is a little bit beyond the scope of what you as an active listener can help. Um, and we also do community events where we just bring people together to connect with people outside of their, you know, immediate social circles. We do workshops and active listening. Um, and, and all of this really kind of validated that, that thought of, you know, all people really need is someone who is going to listen to them. So the next kind of phase of my wellness journey I was approached, it's 2020, so this would have been three years ago. I was approached to be um, essentially the face of the Bell Let's Talk campaign. And if you're not familiar, Bell, the media company, holds this yearly campaign in January where they, they really try to destigmatize um, mental health disorders, mental illness. And I was approached by them. They had kind of, I think they might've even read that article I just showed you that was in the Montreal Gazette. Um, 
and they asked me if I'd like to participate. And I, at that time, I was feeling really good in myself. I felt like I was in a good place. So I, I did agree to, to do it, but I had no idea to what scale the campaign was going to be. Um, and come January, it was very, um, I don't even know how to describe it. It was a very, very strange experience. <laughs> Um, I, I started getting texts from people I hadn't spoken to in years, photos of, I think this is one that I actually received from someone who I hadn't spoken to in five years saying, wow, like, I just saw you on a billboard. Um, and with the campaign, you know, it's not just the photos you do share your story. It's on their website. Um, you know, went to a lot of events speaking about my kind of journey with depression and it was, it was funny because I had never, from that time, you know, in high school when I was struggling and I never really spoken to anyone about what I was going through up until now, I hadn't really had any in-between steps where I started to open up to my friends. I think kind of maybe in passing in conversations, I would allude to things, but I actually, and it's funny timing because I just recently got a text from an old friend last week saying, dude, what the heck? Like I found out about everything that you're going through from that Bell Let's Talk campaign a few years ago, I can't believe you never said anything to me. And it was a funny moment of reflection for myself that I kind of went from zero to a hundred. It, it still felt easier, even though I was in a better place to open up to, you know, the entire country because the entire country felt like strangers. They didn't feel personal to my life. It felt easier to do that than to sit down with the people that I'm the closest to, to tell them, what I have struggled with and what I do continue to struggle with. Um, so what I would really love for everyone just to reflect on for a moment and, you know, you don't have to share, but I would really love, and I love this quote, by the way, Brené Brown. Brené Brown is a wonderful woman. I highly recommend her TED Talks and her books. Vulnerability is the birthplace of connection, belonging, love, and creativity. Um, I would love if everyone could just take a moment to reflect on a period of time where you felt vulnerable and what was what did that situation look like and what was the outcome of that situation so for for myself, this vulnerability, almost explosion was very terrifying, but also filled with love. Um, I received messages from people that I wasn't even close to saying, thank you for sharing your story. Um, you know, the amount of people that it resonated with really brought to light how much we all kind of keep under wraps and how much we hide away from the world because being vulnerable is very scary. It's not comfortable, um, you know, and, and vulnerability can look like participating in a nationwide mental health campaign, but it can also be in those small, more intimate moments with people in your life where you are exposing your true self. Um, and, you know, there is, a risk of being hurt. But I do think that there is a lot of growth when you're vulnerable and it is received with love. Um, and I think that the more vulnerable we are, the more vulnerability we invite from the people around us. I always say vulnerability invites vulnerability. When I do workshops or even offsites with people on my team at work, um, I do like to kind of open things up with sharing something a little bit more intimate than we normally would. Still professional, obviously, when it's at the workplace, but once that first person kind of shares something that puts them in a position of vulnerability, if they're in a safe place with people that they trust around them, it, it's funny how just kind of the doors will open with everybody else. So I do kind of invite everybody who is here to, to try this out in different situations. Um, and I would love to hear, I'm gonna put my contact details at the end here, but I would love to hear from you if you do any vulnerability experiments. So this brings us to this year. 
And I will, I will actually, before I get into this year, I will just say after that campaign, which was about three years ago, um, last year, you know, things have been relatively stable. Um, you know, there's ups and downs, like it's very much a roller coaster for me, but I do feel like I have the tools equipped to kind of handle these things. But then last year, last winter, I was in a really tough position. It was one of the worst places I've been in probably in my life. Um, a combination of work stress, um, and this was pre-pandemic, so work stress, just winter in general. I'm sure a lot of you experience some seasonal changes to your mental wellness, but I, for the first time, I was doing all the things, all the tools in my toolbox. So for me, that's yoga and writing and meditation and yoga, and none of those were really working. I was having almost daily panic attacks which are not fun. If anyone has experienced them, you know, it's not, it's probably the least fun activity to engage in on a daily basis. Um, and at the time I went to see my, my GP and he recommended me to a psychiatrist. And I think I've been prescribed antidepressants six or seven times up until this point in my life. And I'd always said, I don't want to, I don't want to be on medication. I'm, I'm scared of, how it's going to change my personality. I'm scared of what it's going to do to my body. Um, am I going to gain weight? Am I going to lose my sex drive? Like these questions that I think are very relevant that people don't often talk about, you know, when GPs are saying, you know, I think it's, this might be a good idea. Those aren't necessarily the things that come up. But I was very lucky to be referred to an amazing psychiatrist who was super empathetic and she and I spoke and I decided that it was time to try it out, try it out. And she said, three months, try it out for three months. If it's not working out, you can, you know, you can, you can get off them. And I, I'll never forget that moment that I was sitting there with that first little antidepressant in my hand, feeling like, am I actually going to do this? And, and I did. And honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm still on them now. It's two years later. My long-term goal is definitely not to be on them for life. Um, but it was truly incredible how these things can, can kind of, can stabilize you. And, you know, they don't, they're not happy pills by any means, but they pull you out of that really, really dark place. Um, so that, that was just a kind of caveat this year, because I, I think I'm not, and I don't want anyone to think that I'm saying like, I'm not pro-medication, I'm not anti-medication. I just kind of want to speak to, my experiences and all the kind of things that I've tried when dealing with my own mental health. Um, so then 2020 happened, uh, you know, last March, I think I had a trip, I had a trip booked to Austin. I was going to this conference South by Southwest. And I remember, um, I think it was a Tuesday night. I was supposed to fly on a Wednesday morning, early morning. And then I woke up that morning and, you know, things were starting to get a little bit strange. And I said to myself, you know what, maybe I'll just postpone the flight until Friday. Like maybe by Friday, things will have calmed down and I'll be able to go. Things did not calm down by that Friday. Um, you know, things really kind of exploded. And this year, I think for a lot of us has really forced us to, to pause the daily hustle and bustle that we go through. We have been forced into social distance and, and truly isolation. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's very strange, I think, for a lot of us that, you know, the, the things that we can do to help the overall health of our friends and family is to stay very far away from them. That's just not n normal for humans. We're very inherently social creatures. Um, so I have had to really re-navigate how my mental health fits into all of this because I am a very extroverted individual. And I think whether or not you're extroverted or introverted or anywhere in between, it's, it's very difficult. You know, we have to spend a lot of time alone, whether that's, you know, living alone by yourself or living with a partner or roommates, our social settings have drastically changed. There is a lot of anxiety too. You know, there is a lot of insecurity about the future. You know, what's going to happen? There's fear for our friends and family. Um, and I think this year has kind of, you know, just when I was feeling kind of like, I, okay, I have a handle on it now. I think I know 
how to deal with my mental health under any circumstance this year happened. And it's been truly, truly eye-opening to see how quickly that world can kind of just change um, with a flip of a coin and how you're forced to, to look at yourself and look at the ways that you are living your life and kind of reimagine like, well, what's that gonna look like moving forward? How am I gonna find connection when I am supposed to stay confined to my apartment? How am I supposed to find connection when having, you know, in-person human interaction actually puts myself and the people that I love in danger? So um, we do have a poll question here. And so bear with me, I think I know how to do this. Um, one moment. So I, I'm just asking the question, I would love to hear from everyone participating, how your mental health has changed over the course of the pandemic. Um, so the three options you'll see here are improved, no change, or worsened. I think I just launched it. So I'll just give a minute or so. I think we have oh, a few more. All right, we're just about, we just about have everyone. So um, I'm not sure if you can see the results and yeah, actually if someone, you can? Okay, great, yeah. So I think improved 12%, uh, not changed 44%, worsened, 46%. So I think this is very much in alignment with what I've kind of experienced just in talking to friends and family and colleagues. You know, I, I do think that there is some people that this pandemic has actually voted pretty well for them. You know, they're able to get into whatever routine they don't have to deal with, I don't know, commuting or going into the office and interacting with, you know, that colleague that they don't like. Um, there's definitely a lot more flexibility in our schedules. You know, you can be working at home in front of your computer um, and then doing your laundry and cooking lunch all at the same time. Um, but I do think for a lot of us, you know, when you see 46%, which is the majority of the respondents by a hair, um, it, it has worsened. And I think that this is really because of the things that I, oh, hold on, I'll share the results. Oh, stop sharing. How do I get rid of this? Hmm. Okay, well, I don't know really how to get rid of this poll thing. I don't know if it's visible on your screen or just mine. Oh, hold on a second. I just, you hit the red button at the top. Okay, yeah, I got rid of it. So, hold on, I'll just go back a slide. So this I thought was really interesting. This is a study done by StatsCan. So nearly a quarter, so 24% of Canadians are reporting fair or poor mental health post pandemic. And this is in comparison to 8% in the same survey that they did in 2018. And so these are the main kind of driving factors that I think, you know, there's a ton of worry and fear about health, health not only of ourselves, but of our loved ones. You know, there's job instability and for students, there's kind of that future job instability of, well, what's gonna happen when I'm finished school? Um, a lot of people have experienced loft, loss of loved ones. You know, we have completely different lifestyles. We all basically stay within a few block radius. Our sleep schedules are different. Um, we have seen an increased use of substances, alcohol, tobacco, and, and ultimately I think the lack of in-person social interaction is really difficult. Um, I think we all went through a little bit of a Zoom phase in the first wave, and I know that I personally had quite a bit of Zoom fatigue towards the end of it. So the, the next question that I would like to ask everyone, and let me pull up the poll again, maybe it'll go a little more smoothly, is have you felt lonely this year? So who here has felt lonely? So one moment while I pull this up, there we go.
All right, so the results, 69% of everyone in this call right now have felt lonely this year. 27% uh, haven't, 4% aren't really sure. Um, and I'm interesting to hear from the people who aren't sure because my, my next question, and you know, maybe I'll come back to this, but I think this is really interesting because before the pandemic, so you know, before we were all forced into isolation and social distance, the stats uh, from this, um, this, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The study that um, I found showed that between 10 to 40 percent estimated across Europe, USA, and China reported that their people felt lonely, and this is before we were forced into basically confinement. So I would love for everyone to just think for a moment about what does lonely mean to you? And there's no right or wrong answer. Um, if you wanna jot down a note, you're not gonna to have to share it, but really kind of do a deep dive. What does being lonely feel like to you or what does it mean to you? So there are a few things that I've read about loneliness because I have felt lonely a lot. I've really gone through periods of time where I felt very, not just alone, because I do really love being alone, but feeling like I'm not having, you know, what I've written here, which is authentic human connection. Because I don't, for, for me personally, loneliness doesn't necessarily mean you're spending a lot of time alone. I do think that spending a lot of time alone can lead to loneliness, but I'm sure that we can all think of conversations or social interactions that we've had with other people that have actually left us feeling more lonely afterwards. And so the way that I think about loneliness and the opposite of loneliness, which to me is connection, is having these authentic human interactions. And I wrote kind of this little definition here. So interactions that we have freely chosen and which allows us to express who we are. So in other words, interactions that reflect our values and our identity. So I'm sure that everybody here probably has a few people in their lives where the conversations that you have or the meetings that you have with them are a little bit draining. You don't come away from them feeling oh, like I feel connected to something bigger. I feel connected to a community or this person. There can be interactions that you have that actually lead you to feeling more isolated and more lonely. And so kind of keeping this in mind, I would like to move to some discussion questions. Um, I'm not exactly sure the logistics of the breakout rooms, but I, I might let uh, Dr. O'Neill or someone else from the team kind of explain how that's going to work. But I would really like everybody to kind of keep these things uh, top, top of mind. And I would also really invite everyone when you're having these conversations to not put up any facade. Um, I really invite everybody here to be vulnerable with these discussion questions and to open space for authentic human connection. Um, no pressure, just come as you are. And from here, we'll move into the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. So Joy so, is going to put us into our breakout rooms and you're going to pop into the five breakout rooms periodically. Yeah. And each of the breakout room facilitators have your questions that you wanted us to work through our groups with. So for people going into a breakout room, do they have to follow the instructions on the screen, Joy, or are they automatically assigned? They're automatically assigned. 
Okay, perfect. So I guess we're ready to go and we will see everybody as a larger group in about 20 minutes.